OK, so everyone can still see the screen. So here we have Frida Kahlo, and it looks like she's holding one of the objects that Diego Rivera and she collected as their part of their celebration of Mexican identity. And in a moment, I want to look back at the book we're reading, uh, a biography of Frida Kahlo. And I want to focus on some of her use of costume and Mexican costume. The author puts it, uh, well, let, let me start there because you see her dressed in the costume here. What page is that in my notes here? Well, it's page 111, in case you want to know where I'm looking here. So on page 111, 112, it says, the elaborate pack packaging was an attempt to compensate for her body's deficiencies, for her sense of fragmentation, dissolution, and mortality. Ribbons, flowers, jewels, and sashes became more and more colorful and elaborate, elaborate as her health declined. In a sense, Frida was like a Mexican piñata, a fragile vessel decorated with frills and ruffles filled with sweets and surprises, but destined to be smashed. Just as blindfolded children swing at the piñata with a broomstick, life dealt Frida blow after blow. So that's one important sort of way the author characterizes Frida's embrace of costume and or her mestizaje roots and or um, Mexican identity. And I also want to add to that this part here where it says Frida was a city girl formed in a bourgeois and later an upper bohemian milieu that had nothing to do with the simple life of the Mexican Indian. It is not probable that for Frida as for others in her set who dressed in Mexican costumes, donning peasant clothing had to do with the fashionable no notion that the peasant or Indian is more earthbound and thus more deeply sensual, more real than the urban sophisticate. By wearing native dress, women declared the primacy, the primacy of their link with nature. The costume was a primitive mask, releasing them from the strictures of bourgeois mores. So on one hand, I think we'd all agree that Frida Kahlo is entitled to dress however she wants, especially if she's kind of in Mexico embracing these mestiza, uh, mestiza roots. On the other hand, it's interesting that the author characterizes this as sort of, you know, something that um, is somewhat fashionable. But I also, as I'm reading it, I realize, you know, that's something that's probably out of the reach of a lot of Americans, depending on your ethnic roots, as far as finding some outfit, outer attire that might make you feel a deeper connection beyond sort of your grandparents or your parents. So that's something we're going to talk about a little bit today. And also the idea that um, she's sort of compensating. And I don't know if I definitely agree with that author, with the author's way of reducing it to compensation, because I think a lot of people maybe with disabilities or with health issues but wouldn't, wouldn't embrace the costumes that Frida Kahlo embraces. So, you know, I don't know if I necessarily would agree with that characterization that Frida Kahlo's only reason for decorating her suffering and um, kind of embracing it was sort of compensating or not the suffering so much as her, her perceived physical, um, I don't know what you want to call it, physical aspects. Um, I think it has more to do with just sort of maybe it gave her permission to embrace that side of her but I think there's a lot of people who might be in her shoes who wouldn't embrace that sort of her that's this side of her personality that we see so yes it is inseparable from her physical suffering and sort of her maybe self-image but I don't think it's fair to completely kind of reduce everything to sort of that I think she's a little more complicated than that and yet I still love this pinata image just because I think you can see how her work is Loaded with loaded with fragility and color, um, and I think it's a really wonderful image. So there's wonderful moments in the book like that that really shine. That I think uh, treat the bring Frida down to earth. Um, so I, I think probably you know there's some element of her having to address her physical issues. Like for instance, if you're in New York City, it's very hard to walk around more than a block or two. Um, if you have, you know, a bad leg or any disability. So, you know, things like that, I think, are very important when it comes to thinking about her experience in New York with Diego Rivera. So these are just two things I think are very interesting, This the importance of her sort of self-image 
But I think a lot of that has to do with her painting self-portraits and celebrating her identity. Um, and the other thing, of course, is her physical health. Let me, I think I have a chat here, but I can't read it for some reason. Um, oh yeah, there we go, just Valerie. Okay, great. So let's go ahead with Frida Kahlo um, and talk about her life. And I think the most important thing I wanna focus on today is her transformation into sort of an autonomous, sort of powerful being that you see on the right free from her sort of fixation or um, dependence or emotional dependency on Diego Rivera. And I think these two pictures really show you that transformation from sort of a more doting wife, who's I think definitely embracing her mestiza identity sort of as part of her relationship to Diego Rivera and sort of also reflecting this era that they're in of Mexican identity, including um, it's it's ancient roots going all the way back to Aztec culture. Her her reboso. Tell me if I'm saying that word wrong, but I think it's a uh, reboso. The word sh the, the shawl she wears is a big part of that identity. But I think on the right you see she really goes from being that doting wife to being a fully sort of autonomous being. And her painting I think mirrors this transformation into a woman who sort of burst that bubble of romance that you see in her youthful years with or younger years with Alejandro um, and you see how she sort of shifts that love away from perhaps sort of the hope and and romance with Diego toward I think her herself her her pets her painting and find some kind of peace uh, I think with herself and maybe even with Diego Rivera and I think that journey that she takes is something so important for everyone, including an artist. And I think her pictures really capture that sort of journey from being more innocent and maybe naive about Diego Rivera or about changing him, but also, as, and, and out of that comes a sort of transformation that she undergoes into a very, you know, mature artist with, you know, with artwork that I think is equal or better to uh, better than anything Diego Rivera created as far as channeling these authentic emotions into a painting that really is gripping and stunning and, and uh, just loaded with emotion. So that said, let's go ahead and we'll revisit this idea of her transformation. Let's start with her very young years. I think you guys have probably seen uh, the photo I think on the left is probably in the book. And the photograph on the right is important because this is a photograph that shows her family, number one. And I think really goes to show, this is her mom, I believe, down below. And it shows a sort of mestiza roots and that sort of um, kind of juxtaposition of European and mestiza or the mixed race Mexican identity. And as we've talked about before, the painting of the two Fridas really shows that internal struggle between those two identities, the mestiza and the European. And I think also early on, you could see that she's also sort of someone who's of two worlds, someone who embraces sort of her femininity and even I think her masculinity. And I think her bisexuality is very much part of that sort of her being someone who's very different than sort of your typical conventional um, sort of, I don't know, roles that we all play in society. And so that's why I think when the author of the book we're reading talks about her compensating, I think, you know, it's she's much, Frida Kahlo is much more complicated than um, than her injuries and her health defects, than her um, identity. She's she's a lot of different things, and it's very feels like it's very unresolved. Um, and and she's still sort of finding her place. Um, you know, trying maybe trying to find some sort of clear sense of identity throughout this journey with Diego Rivera and her own painting. So this will come back throughout her paintings as far as. Her, this self-identity, self-perception, transformation, uh, transforming along with her own maturity as a person. And of course, this painting on the right almost feels like a, a returned, a full circle return back to her um, early years. And I think in her 30s and 40s, we really see her revisiting this sense of childhood identity, a Mexican identity as part of her way of transforming out of the crisis or the, the, the pain of of miscarriage and or divorce. And I think she, right, she, the closest artist I can think of for me who resembles a sort of fierce feminine sort of power imagination, um, sort of fierce kind of individuality is someone like Georgia O'Keeffe whose paintings likewise have that sort of bold kind of um, in your face 
directness. Um, so I wonder if Frida Kahlo and Georgia O'Keeffe um, were fans of each other because the, the time period doesn't um, um, overlaps to a degree, does overlap to a degree. So that might be another artist you might consider. So these are some of the possible themes that come up in her life. And I think the most important ones for me are sort of dependence, masquerade, identity, and of course, suffering is such an important part of Frida Kahlo's life. And we'll look at how suffering relates both to sort of her subject matter and to the sort of greater world of art history. So any questions for now? Let me take a sip of coffee. Everyone else is welcome to take a sip of coffee right now. <laughs> so she had polio as a child. My uncle had polio as a child. I think polio is now, um, well, we have a vaccine for it, but it was called like the summertime disease where if kids went outside, it was this silent, deadly disease um, that you just sort of got invisibly like by playing with other kids and devastated people's limbs and other parts of their body. And I think that really marked Frida Kahlo as far as maybe her self image um, with a slightly peg leg or, or a shorter leg that, that interfered with her walking and was something that probably, um, you know, something that interfered with her sense of, you know, identity or maybe functionality, able her ability. Um, and something as simple as walking through New York City was that much harder uh, for her. So that's definitely something in the background of her life. And of course, we know that her body only continues to suffer as we move forward. So I think she had a really close relationship with her father. That's the impression I get. He seemed like a really cool guy. Of course, I don't remember if you if you remember, or I don't know if you remember what she says, what he says to Diego Rivera when Diego Rivera is courting Frida Kahlo. He says, she's the devil, uh, if I remember that correctly, which I think shows the sort of father's sense of kind of wit and charm but also I think he's being, he's, he's giving Diego Rivera a sincere warning that his daughter is maybe a handful that she's, um, yeah, it says, well, I've warned you, he said and left. So the father, I think, has a really wonderful sense of wit and, you know, humor and um, bluntness and having a good relationship with your parents is often a good sign of having, you know, being able to have a good relationship with another person. So, you know, I think she seems pretty well grounded as far as her upbringing which is not to say that there aren't parts of her life that might sort of uh, unmoor her from that groundedness. And that could be things like her physical suffering and Diego Rivera himself, his philandering. So here she is, take a photograph taken by her father. And, you know, it's, for me, it looks like she's pretty sad in this photo, um, although she's, of course, donning her um, glorious mestizaje, um, mestiza outer attire. Probably the sadness here comes from maybe the miscarriage. This is around the time of Henry Ford College. Um, so, and it, but what a beautiful thing to see a daughter photographed by her father and sort of it's really kind of completes that circle of him being interested in photography and of course the importance of her um, using, looking at photographs for reference when she paints self portraits. Here's one of her earlier paintings. And, you know, she started painting in around 1925 when she had her birth. Uh, sorry, I say birth because she refers to that or as losing her virginity, which is a you know, very crass way of um, kind of processing what happened with the, the rod that penetrated her pelvis when she was in, in the bus accident in 1925. And painting became, I think, a really important part of her convalescence, her, her, her recovery. Though here you could see an early painting um, by her from a few years prior, you really see the transformation of Frida Kahlo to um, what we see here in 1926. So from 1922 to 1926, it really looks like, you know, those years were very eventful and and she matured as a woman quite a bit. And you could see the, uh, the mat maturity physically, as far as uh, physical maturity and also sort of her, her attire transforms, but still not into the sort of, uh, into the Frida that we know. I think that comes with um, her getting a little older and also embracing her mestiza identity as part of her romance with Diego Rivera. And I think that deepens when she goes to the United States and kind of sees the contrast between Mexico and the United States. And even though she seems very miserable in the United States, and we'll definitely focus on a lot of her uh, comments uh, about being in quote unquote Gringolandia, she, um, she, sorry, I just lost my train of thought because someone was outside. Uh, even though she's hates the United States to a degree, I think it has a very important impact on her life as far as deepening her sense of Mexican identity. And I would even argue that it looks like 
the United States had more of a transformative effect on her than even on Diego Rivera or um, Orozco. So let's see if you guys agree. Here's uh, an early drawing of her bus accident. And you know, it already resembles those ex boto paintings we saw. Uh, I think as artists, any of us would probably happily use art to help recover from anything. And you can appreciate as artists, the value of painting or drawing or having something to do besides watch TV. Of course, back in her day, you couldn't watch TV. So what would you do? Listen to a phonograph, read books. And I think her father was really supportive of her painting while she recovered from this bus accident. And, you know, it's a horrible accident, really this fluke thing that absolutely um, marks her life because it means she can't have children. It really hurts physically. You know, I think her body is, you know, broken pelvis is sort of like breaking the frame on the canvas. You really are sort of breaking a really central part of your sort of physical architecture. And, you know, it's a freakish sort of accident with the gold, almost a surreal accident. And I think it, you know, pops up it repeat, repeatedly pops up in her life because of the sort of pain, the enduring pain from this accident. So, you know, ex voto paintings are this wonderful way of her channeling that. And that transformation that we see, the ongoing transformation, I think really reaches that sort of um, recognizable zenith here on the right with Frida Kahlo uh, in her sort of classic Frida Kahlo mode. So at first portraiture seemed to be her main sort of focus. And I think for me, it reveals a lot about the importance of every of other people in her life. I think she's got a very vibrant community of people, a constellation of people around her, which partly is because maybe she's confined to a bed for a long time and people come visit her um, as she recovers from her accident. I think also though, she's just someone who loves having a lot of people around, loves a sense of community and is really has a lot of close relationships to people, which goes a long way in explaining why she feels, she will feel very isolated and maybe miserable apart from all these people when she goes to the United States. And they are really powerful portraits, both in terms of color, the connection between her and the subject matter. There's something really unflinchingly sort of honest without being too pretentious and trying to impress you. Maybe someone like Alice Neal would be maybe a, a comparison. But I think what I see when I see her portraits is some of the early parts of her surrealism, some of her transformations with her outer attire. I think though these, these, these costumes, again, to kind of criticize the author of the book we're reading, aren't so much her compensating so much as her doing a lot of painting and understanding that, well, you don't want to just paint yourself wearing the same thing every day. Maybe wear this, try this. As in the same way people, you know, want to maybe wear different things for different photo photography today. I think if you're photographing yourself every day or you're painting yourself every day, there's a lot of reason why you'd want to sort of try different things on. And I think a little that goes a little ways in explaining her sort of fascination with masquerade and, and costumes and embracing that side of her identity or personality. And, um, you know, these, these close relationships, I think you can really see with all these different people in her life prior to um, getting married to Diego Rivera, which she does in 1929. And here's an early picture of them. I think we saw this before. So immediately you could probably notice is her work might be what you call sort of free from politics, depending of course on how you define politics. And I think this has a little bit to do with her sort of development as you know, her, her political development, but also sort of has a little bit to do with sort of how we think of politics and sort of what it means to be political. And I think some these are some of the things she's tackling as she meets Diego Rivera and is there when he's painting some of his major murals at the National Palace in Mexico. And you see that influence here. Let me ask you guys, where do you, what do I mean by seeing that influence here? Do you see any Diego Rivera in this painting here, having looked at Diego Rivera last week? And if so, what? Or if not, never mind. <laughs> Any Diego Rivera resemblance here? I think that with, uh, you can see a little bit with the very face on people because he likes to stack people on top of each other or like next to each other. I don't know how to describe it. But then yeah. he also likes to depict working class. I mean, the guy with the bag 
probably symbolizes someone that isn't necessarily a working class, but generally average people and not, not here's a celebrity, here, here's the president. So yeah. Well, except yeah. I know Diego Rivera also painted Stalin, so or Lenin, sorry. So uh, yeah, I, I I totally agree with you. There's something about this that captures like the putting a bunch of people together is almost like a a sort of uh a snapshot of society they they all are more than just individuals they almost represent maybe different parts of society in a very diego rivera way uh also they're sort of in some kind of environment which you know locates them somewhere perhaps but i think the thing that makes them so rivera like to me is they're so sort of kind of they're not emoting <laughs> they're on, the bodies are a little more botero like and it seemed really like she's kind of she's she's dabbling in some Rivera here. Either the faces are very blank and kind of just staring out at you, and they're also sort of crowding people together. Now, the idea of painting people at a bus stop, of course, is also similar, relates back to her accident. And sort of I think it's it's hard not to sort of wonder if this is another aspect of her tackling the the bus accident from another point of view. And you know, the idea of showing a picture of people all together waiting for the bus is a very democratic moment. It feels very much fitting for this Mexico in the early 20th century, recognizing all of its the facets of Mexican identity. And waiting at a bus stop for the bus is a something similar to waiting maybe for the subway in New York with different classes joining together to ride the subway because that's the most efficient way of going to work rather than taking a helicopter, you know, even the rich ride the subway. So there's a lot of Rivera here, I think, in this Frida Kahlo, but I think it's not, um, there's a, it loses a lot of the emotion that I've seen with other Frida Kahlo. So in the next few examples, I think you'll see some of that influence between the two artists. Um, even here, I think you could see that influence of Diego Rivera. And I wouldn't be surprised if Diego Rivera saw something where a painting of someone being nourished by the roots of corn or, or the corn being nourished by the roots, um, kind of gobbling up the bodies below. So I think you see that here on the right with similar kind of subject of the landscape being nourished by a decaying body or a um, decomposing body. And so of course, this is a very important relationship uh, for her. And, you know, it's very, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting for me to compare how Diego Rivera is sort of how, how important Diego is to Frida, whereas Diego seems to be kind of, doesn't make Frida as much an important part of his painting, except of course, including her in some of the murals. Now that might sort of be irrelevant because his paintings are much more public. They're not uh, addressing the same thing. And I think that is goes to the heart of the difference there. Frida, Diego is being commissioned to make work that's not really about him, his own self so much as about politics or about industry or about um, America, Mexico, United States, Mexico, whereas Frida's painting really comes from a personal well of, of emotion and pain, including love, including suffering. And I think that really goes a long way in explaining why a lot of people connect to Frida Kahlo in such a powerful way. And we'll see, and I'll, I'll kind of refine, fine tune what I just said as we move forward, especially towards the end today. So that relationship between them, you see their hands aren't totally clasped. She seems very, you know, doting and and almost like the kind of conventional wife that you might expect from a more traditional relationship compared to what we see on the right. So we're going to really see that transformation as we move forward into um, their journey into the United States to Detroit and elsewhere. So having two artists, you know, together, really, you know, these two artists really, you know, you it's Orozco and, and Siqueiros, they have fascinating, colorful lives, but it's really something to have sort of these two major artists um, influencing each other, cross-pollinating and sort of uh, just sort of offer it being a, a, a resource for each other. Now, in the United States, I think some of that is, is strained because they both have very different experiences in the United States. Um, now, San Francisco, I think, is a really wonderful town, beautiful place. It's really hard to be miserable in San Francisco. Uh, so I think that's maybe not as uh, a place that she was so uh, in which she was so unhappy as as she was in Detroit. Now, what do you guys what was the United States like in the 1930s? Because she's very critical 
of the United States. And those are the parts that I take very personally, not not in any bad way, but I, I really found it so interesting to see her thought, read her thoughts about the United States. And so what's going on in the United States at this time? Um, she's very critical of Detroit, especially. Uh, I think though it's important to remember Detroit is not sort of the fully modern city, perhaps it is today. Uh, but also there's a lot of other things going on at the time that might make Detroit a more unpleasant place. What's going on in the background um, in the United States when they arrive in the 1930s? Well, if you remember, the, the Great Depression is in full swing. So I think what she talks about, the, the low quality of life as she sees it in the United States, to a degree, it has to do with the Great Depression and a lot of the, the poverty because of the Great Depression. So... Here's what she says in one of her letters about uh, about New York City, and we'll not we'll get to New York City in a moment. They live as if in an enormous as if in an enormous chicken coop that is dirty and uncomfortable. The houses look like bread ovens, and all the comfort that they talk about is a myth. I don't know if I am mistaken, but I'm only telling you what I feel. So. I really love that she questions herself there at the end because I can see that she's, you know, being, you know, she's somewhat conflicted. I appreciate that sort of um, that sort of diplomacy at the end. And I think she's she's very right. I think if you ever live in New York, it is it isn't sort of pleasant. It's a very hard city. And when we think about maybe how someone from the outside might see the United States, a lot of people talk about Hollywood and the United States being very wealthy. But that might have more to do with maybe the availability of food or, or medicine or high quality of care at a hospital. But that doesn't mean we have great sense of civic community or um, a, a deep roots or sort of, you know, the kind of lifestyle, the human scale, human pacing of life that you have in Mexico. So, you know, it's a, a place of contradiction, as we all know. And I'll read a few more passages in a moment, kind of look at um, some other examples of how she... Uh, what she says about the United States. Well, let's let's do that here since we're looking at the picture of her comparing. Because I think just this picture of Frida that she did is more critical of the United States than anything Diego Rivera made, um, at least as far as some of his early murals in the United States. So she says, um, hold on just a moment. She says, it's on page 171. On the other hand, and this is my personal opinion, in spite of the fact that I understand the advantages that the United States have for any work or activity, I don't like the gringos with all their qualities and their defects, which are very great. Their manner of being, their disgusting puritanism, their Protestant sermons, their endless pretension, the way that for everything one must be, quote, very decent and be, quote, very proper, seemed to me rather stupid. So... I think that's her talking about Detroit there more than talking about New York City. Uh, but definitely, I think she's she's uh, feels what I think a lot of people would feel if you go from Mexico to you to the Midwest to Detroit. Detroit, I think, is definitely a step down from New York City as far as having access to theater and music and performances. Detroit uh, probably then was a much uh, not a smaller city per se, but a less developed city. And I think the reason why they brought Diego Rivera to Detroit to paint his murals was to sort of put Detroit on the map. Um, so what about this mural? What what specifically is she critical about? I think this is a question on your on your midterm. So what are what's one of the three things she's critical about uh, when it comes to her impression of the United States? I would say that she really dislikes how industrialized the United States is and how everything is like machines. And, and, no... and what what particular is critical? Yeah, go back to the smoke part. What uh, be more precise about the because industrialization might be good, but what about it is bad? I was like maybe the contamination of it. I feel like Mexico it's a really <clears throat> like agricultural area. And there's a lot of nature on it. When the U.S. is just all buildings and. Um, Okay, yeah, so maybe stifling, stifling, arc, it's, there's no nature, so, you know, it's, yeah. you don't, no, no connection to nature. I think I've heard people say in, in New York City, people are the nature, because otherwise there's no nature unless you go to Central Park or Prospect Park, 
what else about this picture uh, shows something critical? What is she being critical about? Um, what What is she criticizing here visually about the United States? Maggie? Uh, maybe that at least either uh, Detroit or New York City is kind of crowded. Like there's not a lot of open space. Yeah, so the visually uh, or, or yeah, crowded, claustrophobic, absolutely. I think you see the contrast there with all the space on the left in Mexico versus sort of just a wall of buildings. What else is crit what else is she critical about? What are those uh what are those two things on the very bottom? Yes, they are. Um the air pollution. Yeah, the air pollution. That's why she has that that smoke as a, you know, as a, a, a to connect you to the idea of, of the air being polluted. Um, and I think that's absolutely something we'd all agree that, you know, in an industrialized city, very polluted. What else? What's another form of pollution you see here on the right side? Mm -hmm. on, the, nice. on the lower bottom, uh, let's see, I got two hands up. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Emily. I noticed. There's like a speaker kind of thing on the bottom right. So she's probably critical of like the noise pollution and how loud the city is always. Yeah, I think that's what's going on there. And it's always hard to, to visualize noise, right? How do you visualize sound? I think she's done a good job because it's bright red and it's emitting those little sounds. So yeah, I think what's going on here is she's criticizing the noise. And if you've ever lived in a big city like New York, if you live near a fire station or the subway, Oh yeah, you know, that can be a real pain in the butt depending on how well you sleep. So noise, pollution, smog, you know, air pollution, uh, claustrophobic, no nature, anything else that she, I think those are pretty big criticisms of living in New York or any big city. Anything else I'm kind of missing out that, that I, th I think those are pretty good. I think those are the big ones. Um, and now alternatively, like you said, in Mexico, agriculture, a lot of space. And of course that connection to an ancient culture that, you know, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or comment if you'd like, you know, the United States, it, we're very much defined by being modern. Um, and I think her criticisms are right in the sense a lot, you know, this, the Puritanism, um, maybe, I'm not sure what, I'd like to know more anecdotes from her about what specifically makes her say some of these sort of her very harsh criticisms of with all of our qualities and defects. I think I understand more the idea that you don't have that deep sense of connection to a deeper culture, maybe no civic society, no sense of community. Uh, but I think what makes the United States unique from Mexico is all that industrialization. And um, it means a lot of employment, a lot of production, a lot of you know agri industrial agriculture, industrialized everything. And so eventually that leads to, you know, a lot of commodities, a lot of goods, a lot of um, a lot of services. So, you know, her criticism is understandable being sort of a fish out of water. And she's much more critical in this painting, like I said, than I think Diego Rivera is. Um, but I think you could see they're both sort of processing the same information, whereas although I think Diego Rivera really found industry to be more of a sort of symbol of uh, something acceptable and not in contradiction with communism because industry, I guess, liberates people from having to, um, from maybe unemployment or it just brings a lot of benefits. But I don't think Frida Kahlo really will appreciate those benefits until perhaps she has to seek hospital care um, in the United States. And then I think she does, I think, benefit to a degree from um, better health care. And so, but I think more importantly, her going to the United States deepens her connection to her own sense of Mexican identity. And that's so very important for her life. So even though I think overall she wasn't very happy in the United States and she was much happier in Mexico, that's sort of like, you know, any negative experience might just make all the positive experiences in your life all the more positive. So I think even though she didn't like being in the United States, the the experience was had a very positive impact on her um, sort of sense of love her uh, her refining and, and defining her sense of what it means to be Mexican and what's great about Mexico. So let's see how that plays out as we move forward. So the Great Depression is, I think, partly why she she's looks at the United States as sort of a place that she thought would be a lot more impressive than it was. And she's seeing the United States as a very low point in our sort of history. And this is a wonderfully ironic or patronizing 
uh, headline about an artist who we all know is probably much who's, who deserves a much more better headline than wife of the master mural painter gleefully dabbles in works of art. Uh, yeah, this is so patronizing. It kind of treats her artistry as sort of a kind of a, a secondary. Uh, you can see the painting hanging above her behind them. And this is probably the kind of attitude a lot of people, you know, they didn't probably the wives or the the people in that Detroit jet set of people probably saw her as just sort of a wife who paints. And it must have been really hard for Frida to overcome that language barrier and or be sort of not be someone who's just sort of exotic and maybe sort of an object of sort of fascination rather than sort of um, being with people who like her have you know, a little bit, I think, wider worldview in terms of um, maybe more international, more of an interest, open mindedness about different political points of view. But you really can't blame people for living in the Midwest for, you know, being, you know, true to the Midwest. You're you're not connected to the rest of the world, perhaps like you are in Mexico. You don't have that multifaceted sense of identity and cultural identity. So I think people in the mid Midwest are very happy to go see new cars being made. Um, uh, on the weekend, because that's sort of that's the equivalent of this deep cultural connection. That's that's substituting for something that that Frida Kahlo can very easily embrace without any contradiction, which is her sort of deep Mexican identity. And I think that's so fascinating. You know, if you're from if you're from China, you can you know connect to this deeper culture. Now, of course, if you're in the United States, you could you know maybe connect to your roots. Personally, I'm Danish, Irish, Italian, and Greek. So you know, I'm a mongrel, I'm a mutt, I'm a blend of all these different cultures. And, you know, I, I like Greek mythology, I like, you know, reading mythology, but it's, it would be really inauthentic for me to sort of embrace just my Greek identity and start wearing Greek clothing, I would feel kind of really weird. And I think that's partly just sort of me being a blend of different cultures, but also, I think something about the United States is you are, it defines you as modern. And a lot of people, when they move to the United States, a lot of people change their last name or change their first name and, and leave their last name intact. Uh, a lot of people get rid of their ethnic identity or maybe leave that at home while they put on a sort of modern trappings of modern life to go to work. And I think that's really partly what she's, uh, I think that's what she's reacting to is sort of modern life and the absence of any sort of richness and deeper meaning beyond the sort of material world that we live in. And that's also what I think Orozco was reacting to when he noticed how important machinery was. And I think of the three we've seen so far, Diego Rivera is the most sort of um, enthralled and enamored with machinery and machine and, and anything me mechanical and industrial, whereas, Die whereas Frida Kahlo and Orozco seem to see anything mechanical as more mon monstrous and kind of inhuman. So it's in this sort of place of isolation and um, maybe misery that she has her first miscarriage, that she has her miscarriage. And, you know, I wonder if Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo ever, ever had a conversation about having a child together. And I didn't see anything in the book about that. And I'd like to know more about that because, you know, that's a very important conversation to have with someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. And I wonder if it's something they didn't talk about because maybe they were, weren't were communicating well or, or they were so caught up in the romance that, um, that they never... Um, Sorry, I just intimidated you guys. Sorry, I hadn't pushed that button. I, I wonder if, um, I don't know if you remember from the book, if there was anything about them talking about having kids, because it seems like he didn't want to have children at all, which is to say, according to the author of the book, he did not want to have children or any more children than he had already had with his previous, um, can't remember his previous wife or if Lupe and he were married, I think they were, uh, but he didn't want to have any more children as in with Frida Kahlo, whereas she definitely wanted to have children. So you know, as I'm reading the book, I wondered if, if him not wanting to have children was somehow some force, cosmic force, dictating the outcome of her pregnancy. Um, because you know, who, who wants to come into the world, a world in which your father doesn't want you, your mother really never wants you to, have, you know, to be around. And I think that goes a long way in showing, revealing the sort of lack of maybe being on the same page um, with Diego Rivera, which is to say maybe she was, you know, I think there's a lot of romance and infatuation with Diego Rivera, 
And I think all of us, especially the younger we are, the, same, the more new love is to us, the easier it is to sort of succumb to infatuation. And as you get older, you, you learn, and the longer you spend with someone, the more that infatuation gives way to real deep respect and love, or it doesn't, it gives way to something more toxic. And I do wonder if they just never had that conversation because you know, if, you, if one person wants to have kids and the other person doesn't, that's a real um, you know, mismatch. So I don't think anywhere in the book I read that uh, they had that conversation, but her miscarriage is a real sort of, you know, when you, when one, the husband one doesn't want to have kids in the first place, you know, that you can imagine how the miscarriage only sort of makes everything all the more sort of rough and, and living in the United States while having this miscarriage, you know, I think really is something that pushes her and pushes her artistry to a whole new level of kind of honesty and um, maybe uh, uh, emotional intensity. And you could see her finding that sort of connection to Mexico through the ex voto paintings. And now Frida Kahlo was a devout atheist. And I say that, of course, in, with, with humor, because as an atheist, you don't believe in God. But her channeling some of these ex voto paintings are a really fascinating way to connect to her Mexican identity while she's suffering and reeling from her miscarriage. And, you know, she frames that as sort of like her own birth which you can see here. And, you know, I don't, I don't see any painting by Fred, Diego Rivera tackling his own sort of suffering, his own emotional state, his own kind of using surrealist, um, almost, I don't want to say it's surrealist, but just combining, using his imagination um, beyond the sort of the visible, the sort of um, the recognizable. She takes a lot of really wonderful, takes a lot of risks artistically and really makes herself the subject rather than necessarily politics or you know bigger the outer world beyond sort of her her immediate emotional sort of um pain and suffering and i think this is really the beginning of frida kahlo becoming the artist she's sort of destined to become and a lot of this picture here is full of biographical information about her miscarriage about where she is for instance, the snail represents the slow pace of this miscarriage. And just that alone is so sort of emotionally harrowing, the idea of uh, wanting a child, being pregnant with a child, and then the, the child, I guess, slowly disintegrating. And that's why she shows the snail because it happens so slowly. And that just must be so painful to sort of, um, sort of feel your body and sort of this thing that's full of hope that so this object, this thing inside your body, this person, this developing child is slowly sort of disintegrating um, around you. So where is she located here? You know, this is Henry Ford Hospital. And it looks like you've got the United States in the background. And it really looks like she's really missing Mexico and that support she really had um, before she left um, Mexico. So I think one of the reasons why her painting it, it sort of transforms here, because she's really isolated from all that support network. And, you know, in the absence or the, in the vacuum, she fills that vacuum with sort of this whole new set of vocabulary that's so meaningful and helpful for her to kind of navigate through this very emotionally difficult time. And I, when I say it, I can't, you know, I can't stress enough how, you know, as much as seems she wanted a child and losing that child really will set the stage for the next period of her life where she substitutes having children with, I think, painting. And she's very clear about painting being a sort of substitute for having a child, but also the animals um, and, and objects that she paints, the subjects she paints around her, as well as um, Mexican identity, which I think really helps her um, recover a sense of identity as she sort of transforms from that, um, from sort of the younger mother, hopeful mother to um, sort of the woman she becomes uh, after. So in this, some of the comments in the art by the author about this time, uh, let me see here, page 144 to 149 is when we're, where I'm looking at, but she says, um, yeah, painting completed my life. I lost three children. Painting substituted for all of this. I believe that work is the best thing. So, um, you know, she thinks of this sort of moment of miscarriage, both in terms of like a birth and a death. Um, and I think you can see that this is really the beginning of her fully embracing, you know, um, I mean, she's already embraced painting as a way to navigate out of her um, uh, maybe to go forward after her 
bus accident in 1925, but then the miscarriage, I think it makes her sort of commitment, renews her commitment to painting. And you can really see that deep meaningfulness um, with her pain and how painting is so much more of a personally meaningful experience, almost the point of kind of these ex voto paintings kind of where they are the artists, they're using art to channel um, or to maybe alchemize that suffering to something into something more meaningful. And I think that really goes back to this rich tradition of painting in Catholicism. And we'll revisit this, this subject later on in the lecture towards the end. And the importance of painting as a way to you know, extract meaning from life, extract meaning in spite of the suffering in life, um, and have sort of painting as a very emotionally meaningful kind of um, object that's just sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't need the status of being a famous artist. It doesn't need to be displayed in galleries. It's really um, the kind of self-evidently meaningful for the subject or the person who commissioned the painting. And I think that's why Frida Kahlo's paintings likewise are so popular and so, uh, pow so powerful to people like me and others is because they're not trying to sort of do anything but be meaningful to the person who painted it. And that is such a powerful thing because when someone's not trying to impress you and they're just sort of dedicated to what they're doing, that's really inspiring and very um, sort of, and it's very powerful. So. You know, these pictures are all really not intended for anyone other than the person who suffered the experience. And because of that, they're really honest and and I think um, authentic. And even though she's not Catholic, she's definitely drawing from this Catholic tradition, especially this Mexican Catholic tradition, which helps her uh, heal and recover and find a sense of belonging or meaning in the world without her having her own children, without having children as sort of her, her, her source of meaning. And of course, you can't separate this from Diego Rivera, how this relates to maybe a sense of um, disillusionment, disappointment about their relationship because they weren't on the same page about having kids and having a miscarriage doesn't bring them any closer together or put them on the same page any better. And I think it's important to think about the greater context of uh, you know, childbearing and having kids. And we've seen a few artists who have painted um, pregnant women and they've lost children. And I think Diego Rivera lost a child when he was in Europe. And this is something that is very unfamiliar to people of our generation, maybe up to the point of your grandparents. And I think you can see that here in this graph. Um, someone tell me, interpret this graph. What do, how many children in France in 1740 died, um, or how many, um, I guess, the, how, yeah, how many newborn died before their first birthday in 1740? Uh, I see two hands up, uh, let's see, a Emily. It looks like, 300 per thousand so that's almost a third yeah a third good uh good reduction of those those numbers into a very sort of you know very shocking kind of number which is one out of three um and probably even greater the earlier you get and you could see those numbers go down into the modern era probably because of things like availability of clean water penicillin hospitals um, and all kinds of other kind of treatment, uh, infant nutrition. So that is so important for understanding, um, you know, people's lives before the modern era, as far as relationships and maybe this, the hope of having children and um, this sort of adversity of life in the face of suffering and the reality of, of losing a child. And that's not unlike life expectancy. You can see here in the late 1800s, that's really when some of the world's life expectancy starts going up, but not really until the early 1900s that you see most of the world benefit from the same kinds of things, clean water, electricity. And I think Frida Kahlo's time is really the beginning of this. And I don't think it's surprising that she would still sort of um, be subject to the sort of adversity that we see um, before the modern era brings the benefit of medicine that or other comforts that eliminate infant mortality as a real as a reality of having children and i think that really helps you understand why um, some of the christian paintings like the virgin mary are so meaningful 
to people in this age when people, when losing children was a very commonplace. So um, it's interesting to me that an atheist would find sort of some sense of meaning and comfort in paintings um, that come from a sort of Catholic tradition, but she's doing so embracing this tradition without embracing Catholicism. I think she's more embracing her Mexican identity. And I think these paintings you see from the same time are really her wrestling with a new, rediscovering her sense of identity um, in the wake of losing her child. So, you know, it could be her bisexuality. I think the author points out the two women on the floating. I don't know if that's like a, um, a bar of soap or a, a sponge, but I think what I see here is sort of someone reflecting on, you know, literally reflecting on their sense of identity while, you know, isolated in a bathtub in the middle of Detroit or wherever she is here. Um, and a beautiful painting. So, you know, we, we all can relate to this idea of staring at your toes, <laughs> reflecting in a bathtub. It's a very personal, uh, private experience. And it's like a, a chance for, it's almost like confession, communion, or something like a moment of a rite of, of, that we all are familiar with. That's a very personal moment, being in the bath, cleaning yourself. And, you know, all these little elements for me are almost like jigsaw puzzle pieces of her identity that she's going to collect together. And as she re rebuilds her sense of self um, moving forward, beautiful painting. I mean, all these paintings are so wonderful, but I think especially at this time, you can really see her painting transform from portraiture to kind of embracing more surreal and maybe iconography that's more individualized and or related to Mexico. And you can contrast that with Diego Rivera's output and some of his paintings from the time, which are just for me so, so, so missing, so, so devoid of emotion compared to Frida Kahlo's. And that's because I think partly he's painting pictures, painting murals for a public that wants to know about Mexican history, Mexican identity, whereas Frida Kahlo doesn't have to sort of pander or accommodate those, th that kind of audience. Her paintings are really for herself and for her own benefit. And I think that's partly why her work is just so powerful and engaging on an emotional one-on-one -on -one level. So let's look at a little more um, of sort of what happens in the United States before we get, um, before we take a break. You know, you could see the transformation of Diego Rivera from early on here. It looks like he's slimmed down and, you know, easier to walk around New York and walking around New York, you know, means you kind of end up getting a little more fit perhaps. They could be in Washington Square here. I think that's the distance between the two, the ice cream cone without any ice cream on it. Is such a wonderful metaphor, perhaps, for their relationship now. I think you go that, that you you probably agree from the reading that Frida Kahlo could not wait to get back to Mexico, and Diego Rivera was happy as a clam in New York. And I think that's because the sort of glamour of of being in New York City, uh, attending parties, getting having all these people fawning all over him for being the artist. Really, I think made him have fun. Whereas Frida Kahlo, you know, it's, she couldn't walk more than two blocks without needing a taxi cab, and that really, you know, it's really too bad um, because you know it, I would love to see uh, Frida Kahlo have enjoyed herself in the United States a little more. Um, but I think again, those health issues really make it hard to navigate around New York City. So when they go back to uh, Mexico, I think Frida Kahlo, it's a real opportunity for Frida Kahlo to be happy to. Um, finally sort of find some peace and comfort and maybe even recover fully her health after her miscarriage and and maybe take that experience in the United States with Diego Rivera and, and use it as a um, sort of foundation upon which to build a much happier um, life. And that's not the case as we know, because um, this is right around the time when he cheats on her with um, her sister, Christina who we've seen Frida Kahlo paint quite a few times. And so that must be really, um, that's just a wrecking ball through the family life there. Here we could see Frida Kahlo in the painting um, that Frida, that Diego is, finishes up when he gets back to Mexico. And, you know, his style doesn't change very much. I think Milton in last class, I asked him and he pointed out, you know, similar to the other, the rest of the mural on this, um, in this location. And I think that's partly because it has to flow evenly with um, with the rest of what he had painted prior. But still, I think it also shows that Diego Rivera doesn't, isn't taking many risks, isn't transforming as rapidly or as, um, as, as um, drastically as Frida Kahlo is as a painter. So 
in this period, um, this is when they're back in Mexico. This is when we have Trotsky visit. And this is when I think she can, she finishes up this painting that she had started while in the United States. So let's talk about this painting for a moment as it relates to maybe what we've been talking about. What would you say is the sort of point? What's the message of this painting? What's she trying to do here? What's the focal point here, first off? The dress? Yeah, I think that's the real, and of course it's the title of the painting, but I think I, it's, my dress hangs oh. there. Yeah, and it's and what's notable about the dress? That is really Mexican. Definitely one that's Mexican. And two, what else is notable about the dress? Who's What's missing from the dress? The person. The person, right, right. So, I, I, you know, it's easy to overlook, and yet, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing. I don't think Diego Rivera, I, I, I'm sure he could, but I don't see him having the imagination to do something as sort of simple and yet bold and unique as sort of, let's just show the clothing hanging. And what does that, what what could that mean to have, you know, the clothing hanging, but no person? Um, there are a lot of things that that might relate to. What's one thing that, that might kind of inspire you to think? Um, I thought like, she left her mark there, but she didn't leave herself there. She was like, I was there and that was it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, the idea of her sort of, there's something that she left back there. Um, the dress is sort of a symbol of kind of her mark there. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be in a lot of things. Yeah, you know, she's got the or toy. Maybe, Go ahead. Or, or maybe like that she knows that her Mexican identity is there, but she doesn't feel connected to it. Oh, that's interesting. Sort of. So maybe she's got, the, or maybe like her at that, that's the only thing people saw, but not the real her kind of underneath. Like that, that's kind of like the identity in her clothing and maybe, or maybe she left that identity there maybe because of her miscarriage, you think something like that, where, where um, she's back in Mexico, but maybe some part of her identity is still in the United States. Is that what you're saying, Sarah? I don't know if that's Sarah. Uh, it was, what, <laughs> I mean, no, I was thinking more like, Oh, Daniel. I don't I'm know, sorry. like maybe in this point in her life, she just doesn't feel that connection with her Mexican identity and she knows there, you know, it's an important part of her, but she just doesn't feel that connection at that moment for some reason. Okay, yeah. Yeah, like she's uh, she's not fully there, uh, there. You know, it looks like she's adding some collage underneath those those people waiting in lines down below. It looks like she's, I don't think she painted that. It looks too detailed to paint. And yet also the rest of the painting is so exquisitely detailed. You can really appreciate how much time she spends on her painting. And those people coming out of her dress below, you know, I think this painting seems to be a visualization of the criticism we've read about, we've heard about of the United States. Um, what, what here, Anything critical, anything you see is, is almost like a, a revisit of the painting of her at the border. Now the border is kind of between a toilet and a trophy. I wonder if that's her way of showing the United States as sort of, it's just sort of a trophy. Uh, she was, you know, hanging between a trophy and a toilet. Is that, is she, com is that a comment on the United States? By the way, I, you notice toilets haven't changed very much. <laughs> Go on, sorry. I think that right. it's like putting the U.S., it's like in a race, it's the, the trophy in the toilet. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a co comment on the United States. Yeah, I would, say, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, I don't think she's saying Mexico and the United States here. It's more of like a sort of a, a dress hanging between these two columns, which are meant to be sort of how she sees the United States. You know, she doesn't, she's not painting any Americans except maybe this woman on the left in sort of this glamorous outfit. Um, and it's sort of like a, a postcard picture of New York. It looks like the Lusitania or something in the background. Some little references back to the previous painting she did, but I think this is probably just someone reflecting on uh, the stuff in the garbage can on the right. Looks like maybe some of the European clothing or just, you know, just definitely is a very cold, sterile view of the United States as maybe not at all what she expected or didn't a very big disappointment for her. Um, and here she's back in Mexico. And I think some of these portraits show her, like I said earlier, I think her trip to the United States, though she didn't like the United States, I think it really deepened her self image and helped her kind of 
refine and clarify her own sense of self, both in terms of, you know, in her internal self, but also the outward appearance. I think, you know, embracing her, the, the unibrow and maybe her mustache here, I could very well see that as a response to American Puritanism where people are trying to look like each other or sort of hide any defects or maybe appear, try to materialistically the same way as everyone else. Um, I think even today, probably um, your average American person might try to bleach parts of their body or dye parts of their body or just to try to fit in. Um, and I think maybe D Frida Kahlo here is trying to just say, no, I'm happy being myself. And, you know, that's debatable. But I think definitely the United States had a big impact on her embracing her and, and deepening her sense of connection to Mexico. And so even if we have bad experiences in life, it's, you know, there's always a silver lining maybe after the experience is over, it will help you deepen your sense of self and a sense of autonomy. Of course, all of this is taking place as the marriage to Diego Rivera falls apart, which is, you know, goes back to what I wanted to bring, what I brought up earlier, and we'll maybe bring this up and then we'll take a short break, which is, you know, there's some people self-sabotage, some people can't control. We, you know, and I, I know I picked on Diego Rivera, but all of us probably have things that we can't control or we succumb to some temptation or succumb to our impulses. At the same time, though, you know, I, I, last time we spoke, I talked about Diego Rivera sort of destroying their marriage. At the same time, one thing I think you might consider is even though he cheated on her with his sister, with her sister, the paintings that come later almost seem like you know, maybe it was good in some ways that that she that that Diego be, turned out to be such a disappointment to her because that allowed her to sort of liberate herself from maybe him being such a major part of her life as far as the meaning and purpose of her life. And it's like she discovers her own sense of meaning and purpose separated or individual independent from Diego Rivera in this next period that we're going to go into. Yeah, any comments on this as from reading the book before we get into it more in depth, sort of as you read the book, do you feel like, is do you do any of you think that Diego Rivera like sabotage the relationship because he thought it would be better for both of them? Because maybe, you know, they she had a miscarriage, he never wanted to have kids. Maybe he just wanted, he knew it would be best for both of them to get out of the marriage and he couldn't. He what? He didn't have the, the the confidence or the sort of um, the courage to tell her, "Hey, let's get a divorce." So the second option would be to just force a divorce by um, sabotaging her relationship to her sister and cheating on her with the person who was guaranteed to sort of ruin the marriage for them. Is that? I don't think he was conscious. I don't think he was ever consciously doing that. But when you look at this sort of what happened, it seems like her. She benefited as a person from kind of him showing her kind of his true nature. Um, and I'm just sort of trying to think about the complexities of this moment with her kind of her marriage falling apart. And yet out of that disaster, you know, this new woman emerges who I think is much more of a kind of Frida who has much more of a stable sense of self and um, understanding of who she, who the people she loves. Now at the, on the other extreme, you could say, well, their marriage falls apart, everything becomes very toxic and her paintings become all the more rich and maybe independent because she really just has no other choice. And um, and that could be the case. So any comments on what's, what happens next with Diego Rivera? Do you think, um, do you blame Diego or Christina more? Does it matter? Maybe it's not so relevant to understanding Frida Kahlo. Uh, but I think when you look at her sort of neediness early on because of her health issues. Um, it seems to me, um, there's a voice in my head that says, you know, there's some, all, all things given, all things equal, taking everything into account, the paintings that come out of Frida Kahlo in the next period of her life really are a Frida Kahlo that's more self-actualized, more sort of mature than any of the Frida Kahlo's we've seen yet. And like processing her pain into a, sort of alchemizing her pain into something beautiful and noble, um, without Diego Rivera being necessarily the main sort of source of her meaning and nobility in life. Um, you know, feel free to comment on that if you want. Otherwise, we'll see how that plays out in her painting. So let's take a, about a 10 minute break um, so I can feed my squirrel, hey, everybody. And um, I'll see you guys back at about 9.54.
just going to read a little part from the book. It says on page 181, we do not know that, we do know that Rivera was pleased, let me start that again. We do know that Rivera was not pleased to be back in Mexico, and like a sulky child, he blamed Frida for making him return. And then on the next page, page 182, it says, I'm sorry, 183, it says, and this is quoting Diego Rivera, if I ever, if I loved a woman, Rivera wrote in his autobiography, the more I loved her, the more I wanted to hurt her. Frida was the only, was only the most obvious victim of this disgusting trait. So, and I've seen this quote several times and, you know, it's pretty alarming and certainly a red flag if you want to date someone who says, I, I only, I hurt the people, who, the more I love them, the more I hurt them. And that goes back to a quote by Frida Kahlo about there being, there having been two accidents in her life. One of them was the, was the, the bus accident. The other was Diego Rivera. Now, of course, they do get back together. They reconcile. Um, but I think they reconcile in a way that's sort of more, a sort of more mature, less naive view of love and, or, and, or one that it just accepts the reality of Diego Rivera's infidelity and is a time when Frida rediscovers her bisexuality and rediscovers her Mexican identity and starts having many love affairs while Diego Rivera continues his philandering. So you could see it as either uh, uh, their moment, their relationship coming to maturity or their relationship descending into total toxicity. Maybe both. I think all that time though, you see Frida Kahlo's painting continue to evolve and maybe it just goes to show the contradictions, the paradoxes in life where, you know, even though everything's falling apart, her paintings shine glor the more gloriously as everything else um, crumbles to pieces around her. And that includes her marriage and her body, her physical body. Eventually she has to get her right foot amputated in 1953. So, you know, maybe it's just her painting continues to be this outlet for her immense personal suffering whether it's emotional or physical. So let's continue uh, the lecture. I think it's now 9.54 and then 55. So hopefully you guys are all back and I'm not just talking to a bunch of uh, uh, to nothing. So here they are back in Mexico. And I just read this quote a second ago about how miserable Diego Rivera was being back in Mexico. And I think the opposite is true for Frida. She was very happy to be back in Mexico, but not for long because any of the sort of growth and maturity they and bonding they might have developed in the United States, in spite of philandering and other adversities, will sort of will not come to to any kind of happy evolution because of their marriage falling apart. Even though this is an opportunity, I think, for them to have sort of restored any um, grace to their marriage, um, and I, I think it's because of the sort of extreme betrayal of him cheating on her with her, with her sister. And the author of the book we're reading points out there was probably a strong rivalry between, between the sisters. And I couldn't help but think of either the two Fridas that we've seen being a representation of the sort of inner conflict between the European and the Mestiza or indigenous identity. And it really made me think, reminded me of this painting we saw before, almost like kind of, uh, almost, uh, it seems like a, there's some reference to Frida Kahlo here with the fruits in the middle. There's two two sides of this sort of two women or and or you can see this as they sort of similar to the internal struggle, especially if you see the two dogs down below fighting. You can it's almost like you can see it's almost like a little bit of a Frida Kahlo painting with animals, children, fruit, and this sort of warring, two female figures warring between themselves. One of them more European, the other more traditional. You know, one has shoes on, the other is barefoot. So, you know, I, yeah, this painting almost captures some of the, the sort of, um, some of the conflict going on and some of the subject matter that we see in Frida Kahlo's paintings, um, especially in this period after the um, affair with Christina. So, how does this painting, I, I think this painting, you really have to understand in terms of this time period of, of what we're, and what we're discussing. So what, what is the, uh, what's this painting all about? How does this relate to what we were just talking about? Uh, 
that she feels similar to a deer that just gets shot by arrows, shot after shot. And and what is the uh, source of that pain? And um, you know, who sh what's shooting the arrows? I guess. I think life in general. She yeah, it could be. Yeah, the the, the adversities of. <laughs> And do you think it's specifically, it seems like it's specifically related to maybe the Diego cheating on her. This is sort of her portraying herself as a wounded deer equivalent, sort of being wounded by Diego Rivera. Is that a, a one interpretation? I guess, yeah, it could be. I think it, just everything colliding, possibly. Yeah, I think that's better. I think there's a lot of error. I think that's a better interpretation. There's a lot of pain coming from different directions um arrows coming from many directions like i think she's overwhelmed by you know all the sort of pain um and you know an arrow is something fired from far away you can't usually see the person firing it so you know sort of this you, you can feel the sense of maybe um overwhelmed by pain and adversity uh and it's a beautiful way to address that pain by um you know, appropriating a sort of deer image as a sort of innocent, natural creature that's wounded and you you only feel sympathy for her here. And, you know, transforming herself into a deer versus maybe showing herself punctured by arrows like San Sebastian is a wonderful way of kind of taking her identity and, and maybe you by transforming herself into a deer, it makes the pain more sympathetic or makes perhaps makes you understand um, maybe the pain is like a wounded animal that doesn't know, you know, what's firing at her, you know, this sort of modern arrows fighting, you know, hurting a deer that's sort of just going through the forest. Um, but I think it's probably loaded with a lot of symbolism. The forest itself is sort of rep meant to represent maybe the uncertainty around her and the background. We see that in a lot of her paintings, this sort of tempestuous sky. Um, and a great example of using painting to address your own emotional sort of well-being and to maybe even help you push through that pain. Uh, what about this one here? I think, how does this relate to what we're just talking about? The same period, 1936, why is she painting her family, her grandparents? That's her father and mother, of course, they're in the middle, a little Frida Kahlo. Why do you think she might want to focus on this subject at this time? Think about how that might relate to just going through a lot of pain, maybe later in life. What well, could be that um, she's just re readdressing or go, restoring her roots going back to her roots when in a time of um you know uncertainty like here you know what 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 do you what's the source of your identity going back to the sort of raw most pure most reliable sources of self-identity well, your family your heritage your upbringing so and i'm not saying that's for sure what's going on but i Personally, my interpretation is she's finding some sense of stability in this time of uncertainty and crisis. And, you know, this comes after her miscarriage, comes after coming back to the United States, and then after her husband cheats on her with her sister. So, you know, I could very easily see myself wanting to find some stability in this kind of time period. Um, and yeah, maybe, yeah, that's a child she never had. Okay, yeah, so good. That might not even be Frida, but so much as sort of the child, her reminiscing about what could have been, what she could have had. And I think we could all agree this, you know, a lot of arrows firing from many directions is definitely a great way of characterizing her life at this time, both her, her wounded body, her loss of sort of identity, her sense of hopelessness, maybe not having the child she always wanted. And we could see painting really helping to fill that vacuum or substitute or help her heal um, from, or give her a sense of, of moral clarity or not moral clarity, uh, maybe uh, just clarity as far as her own sense of self and identity at this time period. And I think that's partly why she embraces this sort of, continues to embrace this sort of, these, this out, outer costuming. It's not compensating so much as sort of her kind of, 
transforming the pain into something beautiful and or meaningful. And, you know, this photographs really, you know, show Frida Kahlo, like the paintings we've seen, but now sort of in photographic form. And, you know, I think the photographs are wonderful, but they don't quite have the power, the emotional intensity as uh, her as, as her paintings do. And in the same vein as what I was just talking about, you know, her, these, these dolls are sitting on her bed. These feel very much like she's um, kind of restoring her sense of identity um, after it's been sort of obliterated by all the things going on. So, you know, seeing her hair down, um, seeing the doll, seeing the monkey, these are all, I think, substitutes for having a child, but also I think substitutes for having a sense of identity that's very wrapped up in Diego Rivera and um, the idea of being a mother. And so this, because, this for me is one of the most, if not the most interesting parts of her life where she really, you know, leaves behind maybe some of her childhood hopes and, and or younger woman's hopes and becomes really the full, the self-actualized person she's sort of meant to become without um, sort of all these other external um, parts of, of her identity being important so much as her internal identity. So this is kind of, I think, what you see here, that dress that we were talking about. Um, well, what do you think? How is this different than any of the other? Is this different than some of the paintings we've seen with her at the border? Uh, the two Fridas, the, my dress hangs here. You can see this sort of, it's like a micro universe of all of her paintings, how they interrelate, how they kind of exist on the same imaginary landscape of pain and suffering. Um, what do you see here that that enhances our understanding of her compared to especially some of the other paintings we've seen where she is wrestling with this idea of identity or her own trauma? I think this one definitely reflects on her transitioning from, as you said, her childhood hopes and dreams to like reality as an adult. And like splitting, she's like in this, in between this push and pull between this is how it used to be and this is how it is now. I'm trying to to cope, uh, to cope with it. Yeah, and she's on the border of the water and the and the land. That's you know, those are great thoughts. Of sort of she's in between, and I think that really is a great way of putting where she is in her life right now. Kind of in between that younger era and the older era, or between the sort of naive Frida romantic who romantic who who, who elevates Diego Rivera on this pedestal. Maybe she loves being this sort of. Uh, beautiful, um, charismatic wife of a sort of high status painter. Um, and here, I think she's really struggling to find a new sense of identity. And she is very much in between those two identities here. Um, yeah, interesting, the sort of, she's perforated by this needle, I guess. You got a little figure um, on the very tip of the needle, sort of almost like a fulcrum. And that bleeding heart, bleeding into the water, really, I think, you know, the bleeding heart, is such an important part of her sort of uh, a visualization of what she's going through. Uh, yes, Emily, or let me, Thea, yes? Either one, I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys raise your hand here. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say that uh, the uniform, like the, the outfit on the left kind of reminds me of like a school uniform in some ways. So it kind of reminds me of like her childhood and like this kind of transition mentally I think and in maturity wise um moving from like one sort of way of thinking into another but yet her heart is not in her chest it's, it's on the ground and it's on the side of like her childhood right on that left side so it feels like even though she has like one foot um which seems to be like the amputated foot I don't know on the on the right um as she has like one foot into into this sort of identity that she wants to move towards her heart still kind of lays really heavy on one side and it's uh, this this strange transition and also the the use of red string and this sort of connecting cord throughout all of her work is very interesting to see how she makes that specific visual connection throughout everything yeah that's a great point i hadn't noticed that and and it's a really great observation because that is like a motif in her paintings it's not just a it's not just hanging things, it's also a vein or like an artery that connects to her heart. So yeah, that's a really wonderful way of enlightening our understanding of these other paintings we've seen by her, that she's got this cord that weaves from her heart 
to her identity, to sort of this sense of self. And I, I think you point out a connection between that heart and her perforated body that, yeah, as she's sort of struggling to decide between these two kind of halves, the two uh, maybe history, the future, the past, or maturity or youth, you've got this heart that's sort of bleeding on the floor that's sort of almost like she's making this choice without that sort of heart um, kind of there anymore that she's kind of maybe has to sort of navigate now without that heart being the sort of main guide um, for her journey. And I think that, again, a lot of people in their life have to go through that sort of journey of maybe falling in love, falling out of love, um, whether or not so loving someone else is such a, is a central part of your identity. And if they betray you, you sort of, and, and I, I think all that forces you to reckon with your own sense of kind of worth and how you measure your own self-worth and, and, how your heart can be something that's maybe in conflict with your mind or with your sexuality or your libido. And so I think her emotions are, it's very emotional and a very emotionally driven artist as far as the subject matter, very driven by this authentic kind of connection to emotion. The painting itself is sort of a way to sort of, um, for her emotions sort of to find some channel from some kind of meaningfulness or kind of alchemize something beautiful out of the suffering and emotion um, but it feels like she's here recognizing that maybe some of that emotion there is sort of, you know, it's, she's removed that it's, it's been forcibly removed, like, like kind of by surgery. And so I think this painting really captures this moment in between um, different Fridas here. And even this painting might be her trying to find some kind of, um, I think she in her head realized, you know, um, even though Diego cheated on her, she has to find it either decide, like just let him go completely or to find some kind of um, separate peace or balance with him. And it seems like she decided to sort of stay, stay with him because she does, even though she divorces him, they remarry the same year. And that could just be a matter of economic dependence, you know, that you're better off staying with him and just accepting him as he is. Uh, but what a hard pill to swallow. Um, and I think this painting of him is her maybe trying, and I don't know this for sure, but it feels like maybe she's, this is a moment where she's trying to decide, you know, do I really love this man enough still? What do I, what do I love about him? And it seems like maybe she's portraying him a little younger, but, you know, definitely someone who she loves or is trying to find some value in him perhaps, but it's very complicated because she's, you know, this whole world that she lives in is very bohemian. It has a lot of blurring of boundaries. You know, she's bisexual. There's a lot of other people in the milieu who are, I think, a lot more sort of open and liberal than your typical Mexican, um, uh, Mexican and typical Mexican society. Of course, it's loaded with contradictions in the sense that maybe um, Frida Kahlo was, was more accepting of him cheating, whereas he was really upset about her cheating on him with another man versus with another woman. So, you know, it's a very bohemian world and it might be hard to kind of have a traditional relationship in such a world. Um, so, you know, it might just be a really difficult challenge um, that just to find that sense of stability. Uh, but I think this picture is her trying to figure out where, where, where Diego fits into her life. And even something like this, it's almost, you could feel her substituting Diego or maybe retaliating against R Rivera by like, like offering herself as a sort of mestiza princess to Leon Trotsky. And so on the other extreme, maybe there's a lot of toxicity at this time. Um, so I think you could sort of say either or, it's very a time of her growing and developing and maturing, but also a time of you know, maybe great toxicity and and their marriage falling apart. And I think she's again channeling some of this, um, you know, Catholic tradition of documenting the deceased before they die. It's not an ex voto painting, but still, I think very much in this tradition, Catholic tradition of you kind know, of documenting suffering and using painting as a real um, kind of source of meaning and understanding. And this all begins to give way and evolve into things like we see here, where a lot of different things are happening here. Ch uh, maybe her revisiting a sense of childhood. Uh, her This is like the painting we just saw a moment ago, but even younger than her sort of school dress. Now she's going all the way back to her baby, like child infant state, almost like as a rebooting her um, identity, restarting her environment, her identity from scratch. Or you could maybe see this as her, the baby she never had, the child she never had, and she's nursing the child she never had. Uh, 
yet yeah, and apart from all that so it's just such a beautiful imaginative painting and nothing Diego Rivera paints reaches this level of imagination for me um well maybe with one or two exceptions like Pancho Villa and Zapata being or nourishing corn I think those reach that level of sort of imaginative sophistication that you see here what are those little are those raindrops I think so it could also be like the milk that she's nursing too, like kind of milk is raining everywhere because it looks like the mother is lactating and Frida's nursing from the sort of figure who has almost like an Aztec or I don't even know if that's an Aztec mask. It almost looks like just sort of a tribal mask that's not necessarily Aztec or anything, but just sort of covering the identity of the of the kind of motherly figure here. Um, you know, she often portrays Diego or thinks of him as a child too. So I think in a way her mother, her desire to be a motherhood was satisfied by treating Diego as a child. And I think in a lot of ways, his, his behavior is almost childlike. You know, if you read some of the passages from the book about him, on one hand, he seems to almost be sort of, um, being sort of flattering of, of, of femininity of, of women so everything every man has ever created he says was created to serve a woman so i but i think he's sort of trying to be sort of he's he's trying to you know seduce women by being super you know uh, pleasing them and saying the right things because his behavior on the side seems to indicate someone who's not necessarily doesn't necessarily respect women the way maybe we would define respect as being honest and communicative and loyal but you know loaded with contradictions and you know marrying someone like that really is going to make your life full of contradictions as well so this painting is i think a masterpiece of the 20th century you know up there with the jungle by wifredo lamb and you know masters uh, band control of the universe by diego rivera the dartmouth murals by uh, orozco i think this is such a wonderful sort of it, it distills so much of what we've seen so far as as far as the importance of both her individual identity, but also how this says so much about Lat Latino identity or just American New World identity or modern identity being a sort of a balance between sort of what I was describing earlier, sort of being American and not having any sense of roots, any deep ancient roots and, you know, finding some kind of um, sense of identity in the modern world. And in her case, she can retreat into this sort of mestiza identity, which is such a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, I think whether or not you're American or from Latin America or just a modern someone alive today, this painting says a lot about, you know, the relationship between one's roots and one being a modern person. And that's just, you know, one way of looking at this painting, but also how much it says about her, um, her own journey. And I think you'll find this is sort of one moment where she's kind of choosing the European side or cutting her ties with this other side, her indigenous, more mestiza side. But I don't think this is sort of the final word on everything. This is just sort of one moment of her kind of collecting her pieces and putting them back together. And we've looked at this painting enough where I think we can kind of move on to other works. But I think this, this picture really is a, it's such a major part of modern art. It says so much about the modern experience that's sort of splitting our identities in these two halves and helping to visualize this sort of struggle within. Here she is painting it. The scale is so important too. It's so much bigger than a lot of her other work and the square shape is such a sort of, it has a sense of balance, even though of course you have these two figures split into two, this one figure split into two. And I see more of her uh, really drawing, it, you know, rediscovering her Mexican identity here. These figure, the figure you see in the middle is really something probably taken straight from the shelves of their apartment or their house here. And you know, in the United States, you could never collect you know, objects. I couldn't go dig up seminal Native American artifacts and put them in my house. And so I think you can see how Mexico just sort of is so different than the United States on so many levels. And that idea of reconnecting to your rich, maybe indigenous roots is something not available to all Americans and certainly not, uh, you know, 
having that in the form of collecting these artifacts that deepen that sense of connectivity, you know, you'd have to go to other parts of the world to see those artifacts because most Americans have been either forcibly transplanted here in the in the in the case of Africa or you know migrated from another place in the case of um, Europe or other parts of the world. So you know, it's so interesting to see how enriched their life was by having these you know examples, these physical artifacts of Maya and Aztec culture. And I think they find their way into Frida Frida Kahlo's paintings more. Um, visibly than you do in they do in Diego Rivera's paintings. Like I would have loved to have seen more mech, uh, Aztec artifacts literally in Diego Rivera's work. There's some examples, but uh, I think there's more in, in Frida Kahlo's paintings. And I love that. I love seeing this sort of painted artifacts in, in occupying the canvas um, next to modern Mexico. There they are uh, the, behind her. Spent a lot of time, it sounds like, in the morning, especially painting, um, many hours continuously painting. And these pictures of fruit and everything we see here forward, I think really show this Frida reaching this place of self-actualization, um, kind of finally reconciling something very important within either in terms of Frida Kahlo, in terms of Diego Rivera, or just her own sort of sense of identity. I and mean, it's still kind of maybe a... Uh, she's still fine tuning that, but I think really with a lot of these fruits, and this is, looks like chumba, the cactus fruit with all those seeds in it, lots of seeds. I might remember the seeds are a little bigger, um, but that might be a different fruit or maybe I'm just not remembering things well. But again, even just this has so much more emotion and sort of kind of, it's so charged with meaning than anything I see with, with Diego Rivera. And I think that again comes from Die Frida Kahlo using painting as, primarily for personally meaningful purposes rather than impressing the people who commissioned your work or trying to impress the communists as a way to get back into the communist party or literally painting Frida on the canvas as a way to sort of say, I love you, you know, don't leave me. You know, she's, she's treating painting, approaching painting from a much more personal way. And I think again, that's why she is so well known around the world because we all have personal meaning, personally meaningful lives that are rich with emotion. And I think her paintings kind of reflect that, mirror that, and we can they resonate with us because of that. And some of these things we see in her paintings are her sort of substituting motherhood for you know owning pets. And I think the meaningfulness of these paintings is quite self-evident as far as, you know, it's, a lot of them show some of these other things she's done in her past, like tackle um, horrible stories from the news, um, and also Mexican identity, her sense of self, her bisexuality. Um, this painting is the year that she divorced Diego Rivera. And I think I asked you guys on your on your midterm to reduce this to one uh, emotion. Um, what kinds of anyone want to offer their emotion that they uh, reduce this painting to? Uh, I got two hands raised. Let's see. Uh, Maggie. Um, I would say that it's a little uh, unsettling. Like she's unsettled or she meant to unsettle you as a viewer, maybe? Yes. And what about you, Thea? Can't hear you, Thea. You might have to turn off your mic, open your mic. Daniela, how about you? I get a feeling of like, I want to say vanity in the sense of like, she's like, look, look at me. I don't need you. I'm better than you. Like I have, I have empowered myself and I'm better now. You know? Good. Good. Uh, Angela, how about you? I didn't know what emotion to write down specifically, but I did write down like mental breakdown haircut and that I've been there. It's like, um, I guess almost like a little manic but not like um, self-destructive. Yeah, I can see the manic with all the hair everywhere, kind of impulsive kind of, but I feel, I love that this full range because I can see everything that you guys are talking about. It's, you could see it as a sort of moment of self-destruction, but also as a moment of self-actualization. And I think that goes to the heart of why Frida Kahlo, it's, you know, it's, it's both, it's neither, it's, it's, it's one or the other um, relief. Someone said relief. Yeah. You know, the sense of, yeah, I can feel the relief here too. Like cutting off all that hair is almost like a way of kind of, 
cutting off all that baggage, perhaps, you know, dressing up in uh, men's clothing, traditionally men's clothing could be her masquerading as Diego Rivera, but also maybe embracing her bisexuality. Um, so this could be very much a painting of liberation as well as a painting of extreme suffering and pain. Um, and I think the fact that it's either or can go in either of those extremes really depends on how you interpret it. Um, and I think this painting's at the MoMA. Uh, I think you could go see this at the MoMA still. And I remember seeing it's pretty small and really rich. And I don't think this slide really quite does justice. Um, but this is, you know, think about just how powerful this is to, you know, look, she's looking right at you. The scissors are very sort of, you know, it's almost violent. And yet the violence could be seen as like, you know, liberation, that, you know, the haircut was more than just a haircut. There's pieces everywhere. It's kind of relates to the red veins, the strings that we saw, perhaps. Uh, Bailey, what were you going to say? I was going to say not, I mean, I, I wrote down also that it was unsettling and like, it's, it's a moment of reflection when you look back at a chaotic moment for yourself. Uh, but what because just reading the top of it, it's like, you love me with hair and, and now you don't love me because I am bald. <laughs> right. And I think, I think it definitely has a direct connection with her divorce. Because he must have loved her for her beauty, for her hair, her uniqueness. And then now that everything's let go, it doesn't, none of it really matters. Yeah, that, that makes me think of, um, you know, what the author pointed out earlier about her I identity and wearing all this stuff as you know partly maybe compensating for her physical pain but I see it also as maybe I'm trying to get to this pain this is sort of I think Diego Rivera probably uh validated that mestiza identity and that sort of the mestiza identity was very much tied up in their romance and you know here I think she's offering it to Trotsky as a kind of snub to Rivera and I think the fact that she's cutting all that stuff off and like you point out that you love me for my hair i think that hair was very much tied into the idea of her looking like the mestiza and so i think here she's really getting rid of that mestiza identity as a way of saying look i'm not that mestiza princess that you loved um you know i'm getting i'm totally kind of removing that from my appearance now um you know that's might be one way of thinking about it's not it, it maybe this is the hair that he loved but i think the hair in connection to sort of that mestiza identity and you know you could see this how might think about how this relates to the idea of the two fridas now it's not the european frida or the indigenous but almost something totally new here and you've got to love that she includes a musical melody there i mean you could probably play that da 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 you know like you know sing it in your head and just putting that on you know on the canvas is so wonderful you know it's such a, another sort of tone literally another visual tone and again another example of the kinds of little bold choices that i don't see diego rivera doing much in his work just because frida Kahlo has so much imagination that she puts to use um in her paintings so you know it's a important i think uh moment of reflection on her relationship to diego rivera for sure um, and you can see the sort of this on the other side from Diego Rivera, her, him putting her in his painting in San Francisco the same year as a sort of fully, fully glorious mestiza princess. I think you can kind of see how that identity relates to her relationship with Diego Rivera, both by comparing this painting and to him sort of, he didn't paint her in a suit with no, with hair everywhere. He he restored her to how he loves her. And in a way she kind of, I think, honors that or kind of capitulates. You now she's holding a paintbrush, you notice. Know, so he's kind of, I think, really firing all cylinders to kind of re, re, restore or regain her love. And they do reconcile. They, they remarry the same year they divorce. And I think, though, it doesn't mean that their relationship doesn't have some toxicity from it. Um, but I think she's now find a sort of a personal peace um, coexisting with with Diego, if not depending on him anymore. And I think also she understands that sort of now you know, maybe she's thinking more maybe long term. It's sort of Diego Rivera is definitely economically someone she can depend on, but maybe not emotionally. She can't emotionally depend on him. So you know, maybe you could say this is reconciliation, but I think it's it's um, a moment for Frida to sort of exist without Diego being the most important part of her life. Um, 
And so, you know, this painting right here, I think, you know, someone maybe thinking about death, she's starting to think about maybe the long uh, the future, but really I think the fully actualized Frida Kahlo is someone who I see emerging, you know, you take all the paintings we've seen in the last few minutes and you could see the, you know, the, the unibrow, the mustache, this Mexican identity really still there, but this almost uh, the substituting her child, having a child for the cat and her spider monkey, uh, this, this landscape of sort of, um, it seems like a very happy landscape behind her, not a stormy, uh, like state landscape, like we see behind the two Fridas here. It's sort of this beautiful landscapes, um, dreamy, um, almost reminds me of not Miro, but uh, there's another Magritte maybe, I can't remember who, but the thorns around her neck still are, are sort of referenced back to the pain, um, so the, the pain that she's still feeling. And yet it seems like she's sort of transforming that pain into something noble and she's so stoic in the face of that pain in so many pictures, um, I think that stoicism is something really powerful. And I kind of want to go back now to the, or expand or widen the lens to look at the sort of longer, greater tradition of Catholic painting, um, including the ex votos, but also sort of painting by Catholics in the Renaissance and how that sort of starts drifting away from the religious basis of painting to a more secular basis of painting, but how painting still retains a lot of this underlying religious emotionality. So if you look at the history of art, you really see painting replace mosaic and stained glass as a sort of the medium of religion. And I think that for me, what explains that is the power of emotion, emotionally connecting to these abstract figures like the Virgin Mary or Jesus is much more powerful than necessarily portraying them just in terms of color and stained glass. To have that emotional connection is really something that makes painting become the medium of religion, especially with Christianity. And that emotion you see in Virgin Mary's face, her sort of it almost anticipating that Jesus, her son, is going to be crucified. So when Frida Kahlo is using sort of Catholic painting, I think she's also continuing this tradition of painting that's meant to be meaningful because it's emotional. And, you know, stuff like this is meaningful and emotional because it relates really kind of is a, a sense that gives you a sense of peace and hope in the face of all that kind of struggle and adversity we see from things like infant mortality, which was a fact of life all the way up till the modern era. So remember that when our great, 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 great grandparents or or if you are have any Christian ancestry, they they were looking at these paintings and they connect this probably to just the idea of infant mortality and the idea of, sort of having a child is, and the Virgin Mary being a sort of sense of offering a sense of comfort and peace in the face of losing a child, perhaps. And so when Frida Kahlo, I think, is drawing from 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 Mex the Mexican tradition of Catholic painting, she's still drawing from this deeper well of emotionalizing or finding some emotional outlet for life, some comfort, um, some kind of emotional connection and meaning. And this engagement you see with Frida Kahlo looking directly at the viewer, you see this really beginning uh, as far as the sort of modern idea of connecting one-on-one -on -one with the selfie, you know, in the present day we have selfies, but going back to this painting like by Durer in, the night, in 1500, you know, when you remove the church, when you remove religion from art, you're suddenly talking about the meaningfulness of the individual separate from religion. So we're not looking at Jesus. We're not looking at the Virgin Mary or religious figures or high status queens or kings. We're looking at the average person and the solar. And you can see society reorient towards the sort of individual and our own individual autonomy. And our, the, our importance is based on the fact that we're just sort of nobodies, you know, we're just individuals. And, you know, the artists really lead the way in sort of this sort of affirmation of individual identity, not based on status or being a famous person, but rather just sort of maybe in this case of the Mona Lisa having an inner world. I think why the Mona Lisa is so popular, because she's the first example in the history of art where we're looking at a person, a woman who has an internal world and you don't have full access to it. So it's like we're looking at a real person who, who isn't just putting on a show for us, but rather we see her having this sort of inner world that 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 
is betrayed by some of her body language, her smile, her 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 knuckle slightly being tense, maybe even her eyes somewhat showing showing interest in us, but also interest in something else. And I think that makes her so relatable because it feels like a real person, um, someone with complexity, an inner world that's very complex. And so, you know, emotion and this tradition of painting with emotion. Yeah, I think Diego Rivera. It's like was responding to a degree to this when he looks, he's looking at the frescoes in Italy. But I think Frida Kahlo is really connecting back to a deeper root with painting, which is the sort of emotional meaning of a painting in religious terms, but doing so without any of the religion, um, but still having that, carrying out that a deep uh, emotional tradition of connecting to the viewer on emotional terms. You know, a painting like this says, you know, you're witnessing this thing along with the rest of us. And you think of advertising, a lot of advertising that's successful is sort of, hey, everybody's talking about this product, why aren't you? And so painting comes with this very rich tradition of maybe emotional propaganda or just emotional meaning that comes from religion. And when re when painting gets separated from religion, it doesn't mean we still, we've lost that sense of emotional meaningfulness from paintings. So something like this from the late 1800s, even though it's not a religious painting, it still has that emotional intensity from connecting to the viewer in terms of emotion. You know, this for me, for me feels like a, a modern person struggling with a sense of modern identity being you're now you have to work, you have to put on this uniform of work, you have to get a job, you're surrounded by all these luxuries and amenities, and yet she seems like she couldn't be more miserable. And, you know, something like this is really a beautiful example of that idea of reaching out to the viewer as a sort of a, 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 a for sympathy or from compassion, feeling an emotional connection to the viewer. And yet there's something almost disconnected, or you could say that the, the painting tries to connect to the viewer in a way, on a one-on-one -on -one way that you can't really have in public. This idea of a bystander effect, you can see this here, is basically nobody helps each other out when we know other people could. And I think that comes from one of the realities of modern life, something that Frida Kahlo very much probably experienced in New York or in Detroit, especially where you feel very isolated when there's more people, when there's more kind of amenities, more uh, creature comforts, um, people are going to feel that less, that be that much less likely to be sympath sympathetic or to reach out a hand to help you. And we all know this, you know, walking down the street, you don't know everyone by first name. And so you're that much less likely to help someone else who is in need. And I think what's so interesting for me about paintings is a painting is almost like a defiance of that bystander effect where you can use painting to set up that one-on-one -on -one connection to the viewer that almost is like, even though you can't do anything to help me, you care, you, you sympathize with me at the very least. You know, you can emotionally connect to the subject even though you can't really do anything about it, you're still brought to the sort of level of their emotion. You're able to feel like your emotion matters too because you're able to see this other person in this painting experience emotion. Now, I don't think that's necessarily what's going on with the religious paintings, but I think you could still see how this emotional connection with the viewer makes you feel more engaged and makes this moment, maybe perhaps this moment for the Bible more real, like you're actually there, you can connect to it emotionally. But when we remove the religion, you still have this idea of painting as a source of emotional connection, as a way to either mirror your own sense of emotion emotional isolation or to maybe give you a moment of sympathy and one-on-one -on -one connection to someone else as a way to honor the fact that yes we all have these sort of suffering and internal kind of problems and and a world within that maybe appears on the outside superficial part of our body and face in terms of um, a moment, momentary fleeting hints of our emotion within, but still there's, you know, we can never fully penetrate and experience the other person's suffering completely. And yet the painting is a chance to sort of at least acknowledge that we both maybe have a lot of suffering and, you know, and Frida Kahlo in her case is really transforming that suffering into something well, as I put it here, she's never wallowing in her suffering. She's very stoic in every picture, even though she's kind of, there's a sense of sympathy with her struggle. What makes her so sympathetic is she's not just, it's not a cry for help. It's, it, it, although she maybe is sort of crying out, it's more like she's finding some beauty and, and nobility in her stoicism in the face of that suffering. Um, and I think that really goes back to this tradition of, you know, painting as a source of, 
you know, whether it's ex boto paintings or even looking at Christian paintings where it's all about suffering and experiencing suffering and emotion and there being a lot of rich meaning in emotion and suffering. And, you know, if you think about painting today and like Andy War, excuse me, Andy Warhol or a lot of art today, maybe people might want to focus on politics or on history or on um, innovating art to be different than anything anyone else has done. And I don't think you see a lot of, if you go to the contemporary art museum today, wherever in the world, it's, you know, emotion and suffering isn't necessarily um, as commonplace as a subject as maybe we might see in maybe other times in the history of art. And I think that's why Frida Kahlo, because I don't think you see a lot of suffering um, and emotion in Diego Rivera's work, because I think he's focusing very much on big scale subjects and history and society and communism. And of course there are rare moments of, of a lot of emotion in Diego Rivera's work, but I think the opposite is true with Frida Kahlo. It's rare that there isn't a ton of emotion in her work. And that makes it just so self-evidently meaningful. And so these pictures by Frida Kahlo for me are pictures of Frida Kahlo reaching this wonderful state of self-actualization and, and kind of sense of autonomy as an artist um, and as a mother or a non-mother, as a person without a child, you know, someone who finds meaning without these other things that as a, as a younger person she thought would be necessary for her to be happy, Diego Rivera being a mother, um, and, and probably who knows other kinds of things. And here I feel like hey, there's a person who's finally really happy, um, find a sense of peace without having all those, uh, you know, those other things she thought were necessary for happiness. And likewise here, she loads that parrot with so much emotional intensity, um, looking straight out at you, really connects her to you, the viewer, um, and she kind of affirms your own worth as a person in a way that you don't really ever see in Diego Rivera's work. And these are some early paintings from the forties, which again, I think just show her really reaching a place of kind of happiness. You know, there's two sides here, the sun and the moon, and there are two temples um, on either side, it looks like Teotihuacan on either side. She's got the airplane in the hands of the child, um, you know, modern toy now that held by the uh, woman who looks like a Mexican young woman, could be Frida Kahlo. Here she's kind of, she's, releasing her roots you know she's extending her roots outward um so all these paintings feel very self-confident and feel very self-actualized even you know the still lifes from the time really feel like she's kind of found this place of kind of peace and comfort with her own self-identity um although she of course she's still kind of wrestling with her pain and suffering i think she's really alchemizing it into this really rich kind of these rich paintings you see here now perhaps this one shows still that the, the ongoing importance of suffering in her life but i think you really see these this final or that not the final era but this kind of penultimate era at, after diego maybe remarrying him and finding some kind of reconciliation with him and especially here for me with her hair down other is the only other example we see besides the one we saw a moment ago with her hair down and, you know, it relates very much to the picture we saw with her cutting all of her hair off. Here she's showing her hair down for one of the first, in one of the first moments where she allows herself to do that. And I think that for me reinforces this idea that she's fully kind of comfortable. She doesn't need to put on, you know, the kind of um, maybe pageantry, the masquerade, uh, that mestiza identity anymore. She can paint herself with the hair down and she follows up with that, with this painting, which is her kind of, and I think this is a perfect place to end, with her dressed up almost in that mestiza identity that we saw earlier on with the painting or the photograph of her mother as a child. Um, this is this sort of, uh, I don't know if you want to call it festive, but the sort of Baroque attire perhaps of that kind of era in the mid 1800s. And she's dressing up like this, I think as a way to, go back to that sort of sense of mestiza identity, um, even kind of looking like her mother, because at one point in one photograph, she has her mother wear this, um, I can't remember the term for this collar that she's wearing. But I think between this painting, which is really her with her hair down, and this one, which is hers, you know, kind of in full quote of glory again, this painting really, I think, shows that she's kind of found this, this place of kind of her comfort with her identity and herself. Um, 
and just sort of celebrates her own identity and her own kind of maybe um, maybe some kind of reach her painting reaches some kind of place of kind of autonomy free from Diego Rivera free from um, her expectations about motherhood and I think this is just such a much the most interesting period in her life and I think probably the best place for us to end um, and here yeah you can see the photograph of her mother down there at the bottom and the outfit above showing this sort of not a headdress but more of like a baroque collar so I think that's a good place to end because maybe you could look at the rest of her life and see how sort of her body degenerates and um but i think it's uh more interesting for me to kind of focus more on how you see her evolve into the sort of glorious person free from diego rivera's sort of um influence and free from sort of her own expectations from herself of herself and this sort of a good place to end in this sort of period when she's kind of really finally realized that sort of use of painting to find meaning in her life um, and I think really the, the Frida Kahlo that most people recognize when they think of Frida Kahlo, the sort of fierce woman staring straight out at you um, with this sort of stoic um, sense of in the stoicness in the face of suffering. So any questions, anyone? I don't know if we run too far over. It looks like we're doing a little earlier, but that's okay. I think it's okay to end a little earlier. Anyone have any comments on Frida Kahlo about her life? or anything about her identity, or did I say anything that you disagree with? I've certainly left out a lot. She has a lot of relationships with different people and in this period in her life, um, including Trotsky and others. But we'll be talking about uh, uh, Siqueiros next week. And Siqueiros will be a really important bridge into the Cold War and I think understanding abstract expressionist art in the United States and how it really, owes a lot to the Mexican muralist movement in terms of scale and creating a modern nor uh, identity, a modern art movement that's specific and unique to the United States um, and that breaks from European tradition. So unless there's any questions, I will stand on the line, but I will now dismiss class. So class dismissed. But if you have any questions about anything, certainly stay on the line. I'll have your midterms graded probably this week. <laughs>